Hello everyone. Okay, so I'm not going to do my intro because my intro has just been done for me much better than I could have done it, so thank you very much. Um, so we could just jump straight into what we're going to talk about today. Pixie JS. So uh, yes, my, my third kid. Um, so how many people here have used or heard of Pixie? Okay, cool. So uh, <laughs> that's good. Okay, good. Then. That means I don't have to do too much introduction stuff. Um, so. Oh, okay, sure. Okay, so today's talk will be about um, Pixie.js. So first I'm going to give you guys uh, an overview of, of what Pixie.js is. Uh, secondly, I'll go into a bit more detail on how we use WebGL to uh, make Pixie things as fast as possible. And thirdly, we'll go through some of the features of Pixie.js. Um, some of them you probably know, some of them maybe you don't know, and um, how they're good and helpful for making your games uh, more awesome. And then finally, I'd like to take you guys through um, the future of Pixie.js, uh, what we're doing with version 5, um, and with some of the cool new features that we're kicking up that hopefully you guys might find useful. So, yes. what is Pixie.js? Pixie.js is a 2D WebGL rendering engine with a seamless canvas fallback. Uh, aims to provide a unified API that abstracts away the two different technologies. Um, as of version 5, it's also a WebGL 2 with a WebGL 1 fallback with a canvas fallback. So we've got three layers, but like I said, no one has to worry about that because we, we hide away all the differences. Um, it's for the canvas, um, I think um, early on when we first made Pixie, canvas was really, really important, but I'd say now, you know, 99% of devices all support WebGL, so it's becoming a lot less relevant and a lot of the features that we've added to the WebGL stuff, we just can't backport to canvas, so yeah, it's still there just in case because I don't know about you guys, but like the, the clients that we work for, they have a... Uh, uh, we, look, we work for a lot of kids' games, and basically kids always get their hand-me-down devices, so when parents get their shiny new iPad 5, the kid gets the iPad 2, which is seven years old, and we still have to make our games run on it, and sometimes WebGL is, doesn't run that well, so we use uh, the canvas fallback. Uh, one of the goals of Pixie is to turn um, the complexities of rendering um, into something really simple and accessible, because WebGL can be a real pain to, to write pure, and you know we want to people to be able to make stuff in HTML that was a lot, you know, you don't have to know all that stuff basically. And, and the other thing is, there's so many different ways to write WebGL code to make it fast. It just, you know, we, we wanted to hide all of that stuff so that people just go, make a thing, add it to the stage, and it will render, and underneath we'll try and do all the optimization for you. So with all that, hopefully that means that Pixie is really good for making games. And of course the final one, it's, a, it's all free, open source. Made for, um, made, made for everyone. Okay. Cool, so... Just lost myself. Cool, so one thing about Pixie is it's not really a full game engine. It's literally just only focused on, on the rendering part. So there's no physics, there's no AI, there's no sound. Uh, it keeps Pixie flexible enough so that you can use it as part of a game engine and you can kind of just write your, the way that you want to write. It's not, it doesn't force you, it's not opinionated, it doesn't say make games like this. It just goes, Here's, I'll render things for you and you guys can kind of take care of the rest. Which I've always preferred personally and I think um, there's a, a section of people out there that hopefully prefer that too. Um, the other main reason that we kept it uh, rendering only is because as an open source project we only have a certain amount of time in our lives and we wanted to just focus on making it as fast as possible for rendering and not have to worry about you know, the rabbit hole that is physics and, and AI and, and all, the other, all the other kind of stuff. And of course there is also lots of plugins now in the Pixie ecosystem that you can use so you can, you can use them to kind of bolster Pixie and, and add, add a lot of that extra stuff if you need it. Um, obviously if you want a fully fleshed HTML5 game engine, um, you know, a lot of people prefer to work with everything kind of there all in the box. There's, there's lots of amazing choices out there. There's, uh, Phaser for 2D games is, is really amazing, like full massive system. And for 3D, uh, I definitely encourage you guys to check out Play Canvas. It's kind of like the, the unity of HTML5, so it's a really, really cool piece of kit. Cool. So who works on Pixie.js? Uh, it used to be just me, um, working along till 3 in the morning, hunched over my laptop. But now there's lots more people. So these are like the nine people that, that help um, manage Pixie on a on a day to day basis. The cool thing is, is by the little flags that are actually spread across the world and fairly evenly, so it means we get to offer a 
24 hour service. And each one of these people has brought something really amazing to the, to the project. And um, for me, I just used to do the code stuff, but through the years of doing this project, I've learned that so many things are much more important than just being able to code. Um, and certainly as we have more users now, things like you know, making sure that the new version doesn't have any bugs on it is now really important, whereas back in the day I'd be like, there's version five, oh sorry, there's version three, everyone have it, and because only about 10 people were using it, if it broke, it didn't matter, they just write a bug. Whereas if we were to do that now, I'd get a lot of uh, hate mail, probably. Um, so we have to be really careful about that stuff. But yeah, so these guys have bought, like I said, they bought robustness. Um, they've, they've, they've showed me how to do unit tests, which are really amazing. Um, so basically, we have lots of, like, the code isn't 100% covered yet, but it's, it's, it's got pretty good coverage. So certainly when we're working on V5, these unit tests have come in super handy, because it means that we know when I, when I write my new batch of, all the unit tests break, and that means I have to spend more days trying to figure it out, but it's good because by the time the unit tests are all working, I know that the code is stable. Uh, we've also, the guys also introduced a regular two week release cycle, so we try to do minor updates every two weeks to just keep giving you guys little bug fixes, little tweaks. Um, the community presence is much better now. There's, there's people that respond to people's issues and talk to people in the Slack and the different places where you can communicate Pixie, um, which is really handy because being a, a busy human being, I don't always have time for that. If I have time, I try to do the code bit. Um, not that I don't like people, but I just really like coding Pixie. <laughs> uh, the other thing that's really greatly improved is the documentation. So I've always had this problem where I can't really write very well. Um, I spell like a five-year-old. So if you ever actually do look at the source code, it, it's got loads of typos and spelling mistakes. And it's, it's always been a bit embarrassing when I show people the docs. But luckily, these people know how to write good English. So what they do is uh, they create the docs again, and it's, uh, it's really good. And obviously, uh, big thanks to these guys, because Pixie wouldn't be where it is now without them. Uh, yeah, well, I think we're nearly on uh, 20,000 stars on GitHub, which is, you know, we're, we're really proud of that fact. And yeah, it's because of these guys, so thanks to them. Cool. So, moving on to, I get, let's go through the features of Pixie like, real, real quick. Uh, we have a full scene graph, so that lets you organize all of your objects into hierarchical uh, trees with parent-child relationships, similar to Flash World, um, Cocos 2D, and any other kind of rendering engine. We have uh, sprites, which is how you get a texture bonked onto the screen. Uh, we support, uh, texture-wise, we support images, uh, canvas, uh, there's a compressed texture plugin, we support video, uh, SVG textures, so pretty much all, the, all of the textures are there. We have support for graphics and primitives, so it lets you draw things like lines, circles, rectangles, polygons, and there's a little API that's sort of a bit like the Canvas API. Uh, we have support for text, both regular and bitmap fonts. We have support for render textures, which is basically when you're rendering something in Pixie, instead of rendering it to the stage, like we do most of the time, you can render it to a render texture, which means you then have this texture that you can then use as a sprite, which uh, is super powerful and lets you do loads of amazing things. It's, it's also the, you know, with this feature, it's, it's what lets basically make the filter system. We have masking, so masking is obviously staple for all rendering engines, just lets you hide one object with another object. Uh, we have three types of masking in Pixie, we have uh, vector masking, which is when you mask with a graphics object, and we have sprite masking, which is uh, when you use sort of alpha masking, and then there's a there's a, a third secret one, which is if you mask with a, a rectangle, then uh, it, it does a scissor thing, which is like a really optimized way of masking. But like I say, you don't, you don't have to know the, those little details. And then we've got uh, support for blend modes. So add, screen, multiply. They're, they come for free with WebGL. I know Canvas actually has a ton of other blend modes, but I mean, I could talk about this after the talk, but the reason that we don't have those blend modes in WebGL is, is for performance reasons. They, they require that you need to be able to know what pixels you're writing to when you write your pixels, which is not something WebGL actually allows you to do. Uh, so Pixie is fully interactive. It has um, pretty much kind of we try to mimic the DOM. So you've got, you can just add a on, on mouse down or click events, um, which is pretty handy. We have accessibility. So you can set any object in Pixie to interactive tree, but then you can also set it to be accessible tree, which means that it can be tapped and used as someone with a screen reader can actually tap through the buttons. That was a really complicated to make because we had to make a div layer that sits over the top of the, of the canvas that basically turns all the buttons that are accessible into, into a div. Uh, but it works and we're really proud of that because no one, no one else has that feature. So it just means that when you're making 
uh, a game or something, if you, if you set this accessibility to true, it means that everyone can access your game, not just people who have a mouse. The other feature we have is extract. So there's a, a function in, in the render where you can just go renderer.extract and you can give it anything, a render texture or a container, and it will return you a HTML image or a base64 string or a canvas or pixel data or whatever format you need it in. But that's really handy for, and say you're making a creator and someone paints a lovely picture, you can sort of extract it and then you have that picture and you can save it to a database, email it to someone, do whatever you want to do that. Cool, so there are the headlines. Um, let's go on to the next one. So, um, we'll dive into Pixie a little bit now. Um, I'm going to focus only on the WebGL stuff. Um, because Canvas Renderer is, well, not really that much used anymore, but mainly it's, it's just not really that interesting to talk about it because it's quite basic under the hood. But the WebGL stuff is a, is a little bit more fun. So, obviously, I'm sure you guys know what WebGL is. It's the fastest way to render any kind of content in the web, which makes it ideal for rendering games. Uh, it's got a really, really steep learning curve, though. And um, you know, the, the code required to render a triangle is almost not worth the effort when you look at it, to be honest. But, um, yeah, it's, it's got a, a, a big API and it's, uh, yeah, it took me many years to get really, really comfortable with it and, and even now I'm still like learning something new every, every day, which is really great. Um, I would say that if, if you do one thing, if, if, you're, if you're into making games and you're into, you know, you use stuff like this or you use 3JS or Play Canvas or you use these high level tools, it's really worth learning WebGL. Like, yeah, there's some really amazing tutorials out there that will teach you how to draw a, a triangle. Which is, um, you know, it, that that kind of knowledge, um, like you know, the high-level engines give you a head start. They'll basically go, you know, we'll, we'll render something in three D for you. We'll render something in two D for you, and that's really really useful when you when you just want to make your thing. But if you um, if you know how these things work underneath, it means that when you're using these high-level APIs, you're in complete command of what is actually happening. You know what's going on underneath, and with that, it means that you can. You can bend it, you can twist it, and you can do things that a developer that doesn't know WebGL can't do. So I think um, definitely if you can, like jump on, find a tutorial, and learn, learn WebGL. It's a it's a really powerful thing, and it will make your games stand up higher than, than people who don't know this stuff, um, which is really cool. Okay, cool. So I'm going to talk about rendering sprites. So the the sprite rendering in Pixie is, is one of the things that we spend a lot of time remaking, optimizing, changing. So I figured uh, it might be cool to show you, talk, talk you guys through how, how it works under the hood. So the first thing you need to know is when you render a WebGL, and when you render a texture, you're basically, um, it doesn't render images, it renders triangles like this. So we render two triangles, which we call a quad. And then the, the renderer puts the quads on the screen, and then it, the shader basically fills it in with the correct pixels. That's a top level WebGL. Cool. So, this is the naive way of rendering with WebGL. So, what happens is you loop through the scene graph, and, and when you find a sprite, you basically go, right, here's shader, have the sprite information, have a matrix, this is the position where it is. You bind the texture, and then you tell the GPU to draw the quad. You just go, draw this quad. And then the next sprite you hit, you go, here go, to, here go GPU, here's another texture draw this quad, and that's basically the, the most simple way of rendering using WebGL, like the way that we, you always start out. Uh, but as a general rule, the more draw calls you have, the slower it is to render, so you always want to keep your draw calls down to a, to a small amount as possible, so with this method, if you've got five um, objects, that's five GPU calls, and if you've got a thousand objects, that's a thousand GPU calls, um, and that kind of setup is actually slower than if you render in Canvas, so I'll see if I can get So this is my little bunny mark. Maybe some of you guys have seen this. Um, so this is adding bunnies, and this is basically rendering each bunny. It's like what the GPU is going: draw a bunny, draw a bunny, draw a bunny. And as you can see, we've got to like. Uh, I mean, I'm struggling to read that number, so I bet you guys can't. <laughs> that says 2,000, and at 2,000, we've got a frame rate of 14 FPS, which is really slow and lame, and we can do better. So how do we do better? Well we introduce something called batching. So batching is basically, uh, well, the, the traditional way of batching is, is that um, a 
the older engines, they'd have something called like a, a batch container. So it'd be like a bit like a, a display object container, but you'd go, this is a batch container, and this is the texture that it uses. And then anything you add, any sprite you add to that container has to have that texture, it has to be off that texture of that sprite sheet. And then any, any sprite that's drawn in that container, because they're the same, you can, you can batch them together and basically turn them into one, essentially like one model. And then you send that to the GPU and you go, GPU, draw that please. And that, that's really fast. Um, but this method is, like the batch, the batch uh, container method is, is cool, but it's not very flexible. So if you've got your batch container and you've got all your sprites in there, but then you want to add a, something with a different texture or like a graphics object or something, you can't really do that with that with this model, so we wanted to get rid of batch containers because it just made the API a bit more a bit more clumsy. So what we introduced is the best of both worlds, which is this thing here. And what it is is um, the flexibility of the slow way, so you can add things however you want, you just add things to a stage, but the speed and the performance of batching, so the um, so what it does is it basically automatically batches things for you by just looking at what, what you need to render. Uh, I'll quickly start step through it to sort of show you how it works. So Pixie starts off and it's rendering your scene and it has one big buffer and it moves through the scene and it finds a sprite and it goes, okay, this sprite, this texture, cool. So it stores that texture, puts all that sprite information into the buffer and then it, it goes to the next sprite in the scene and it goes, oh, have they got the same texture? Oh, they do, cool, sweet. So I'll put that in the buffer too and, and it keeps going through all of the objects. And every time it finds a a sprite that matches, it goes, all right, sweet, so it builds up until eventually it hits a sprite that has a different texture, and at that point what it does is it can just render it, just do it all in one go, and then it starts that process again, it goes, this is my new texture, I've got my one sprite in there, I'm going to go for the next sprite, oh, is that the same sprite? Cool, I'll add it in. So what that means, um, it basically loops all the way through until it's rendered the, the whole thing, but what that means is, um, so here for example, the, the batch calls through and it sees one texture, and it goes, and then it sees a different texture, and it goes, okay, so I need to draw this, so it does one draw call. Then it sees the little B, and it goes, oh, that's a different texture. Then it sees the next one, and it goes, oh, it's a different texture again, so I'll flush this and draw this. And then the next four, the same texture, so they all get added into one batch. So then this becomes three GPU calls. And this is the most effective way that you can, you can batch it. And then an example here is if you add another little B, then Pixie will automatically split that bigger batch into little ones. And then if you remove those two pink ones from the middle, then those bees, because they're the same and now next to each other in the scene graph, they get grouped together. And that's kind of how, how batching works. So it's, uh, it all happens automatically. You guys don't really need to worry about doing it, but that, that's just kind of how it, how it works under the hood. So with that in mind, I'll show you guys performance with, with batching. So, so we had 2,000 at 14 FPS. So now, this is basically doing that system, so it's crawling through and goes, oh, the textures are the same, so I'll just stick them all into one batch. And um, I'll try not to waste too much time doing this one. Um, yeah, so you can see it's a lot, a lot faster. And, and this is... <laughs> <laughs> okay, I mean, maybe I should have made this come out a bit quicker. Um, so you can see, yeah, the frame rate doesn't drop, you just get loads and loads and loads and loads and loads of bunnies. Um, so we were at 2,000 before, I mean, I'll, I'll get it to 20,000. Um, anyway, so there's 20,000 and it hasn't skipped a beat, which is really cool. So that's um, batching in, pro in, in, in process. So if, if you have, um, basically this is like the best way to render something is why sprite sheets are so important. Okay, cool. So batching is good, but sometimes in real life, not everything is in one texture. Sometimes you end up with this situation where you've got all these different textures and they're all separate and Pixie can't batch them because they have to be separate GPU calls. And I can show you that same example. So this is the example of basically our batching system with 15 different textures. And they're all kind of one, one texture, another texture, another texture. So this could have been a sprite sheet, but for, for the purposes of showing you guys, I've uh, not made them sprite sheets. They're just separate textures. So you can see it's still it's still okay, but like now we've got to 4,000 and we're at 30 FPS, so you can see it's starting to grind. But this is more indicative of real life because, like I say, you don't just have one texture; you usually have a bunch. Um, so, how do we fix that? How do we shade? We have multi-texture batching, which is something we did uh, a little while back, which um, exploded my brain at the time of doing. 
but we got it working. So the, the premise is, is that the GPU actually has access to more than one texture when it's rendering. Uh, depending on the GPU, you might have 16, which is like a standard for like a modern mobile phone, modern desktop. If you've got like a really killer computer, you might have 32 textures. Um, if you've got a crappy mobile, then you might have eight. Uh, but that's, uh, so, so there's more than one texture you can have on the GPU. And also what you can have in shaders is you can have if statements. So you can, you can branch, you can say if a texture is this, use this texture. If, if a number is that, use another texture. That used to be really slow. But in modern GPUs, that's changed and actually become a bit faster, which means that the opportunity to build this kind of batching sort of popped up and actually now is uh, a faster way of doing things. So I'll, I'll walk you through this one. This is a jumble of words. So if this doesn't make sense, then I'm, I'm sorry, but it's, uh, I'll try to explain it. So what happens is, is we're rendering through our scene graph again. And then uh, we do a texture compare just like we did before. And if there's, uh, so, so we see a texture and we go, cool, we'll put that texture on the GPU and we'll fill the buffer. So now when we hit another texture that is different, that we haven't used yet, um, that sprite's added to the, to, the batch, to the buffer. And then the texture is assigned a slot, so it would be assigned slot two on the GPU. And then we keep rendering, and then we see the next texture, we see the next sprite, and we go, oh, it's a different texture. And we go, well, we've still got 14 slots of the, on the GPU. So we'll go, okay, right, that's, that texture is now assigned to number three. And then we add that sprite to the buffer. And, and each time we do this, we also add a little bit of extra information, which is which uh, texture that this sprite has to use. And then if we hit sprite the, that's got like a texture that we've already added into this system, then we kind of go, oh, this, this texture is using, this, sorry, this sprite is using a texture, the first texture that we added to the batch, then we just go, okay, well, just use that texture. Um, and we assign the ID to that, to that buffer. And we keep doing that until eventually uh, one of two things happens. We get to the end of the scene graph or the GPU slots are filled up with all the different textures. And then what it means is it can take all of these things and all of these textures and use them all in one go and make one GPU draw call. So if we just quickly look at this and we go to... So this is exactly the same code, but with, uh, with this thing. And this, this is the standard way that Pixie batches stuff now. So that's 16 different textures. And no slowdown like we got before. And it's actually quite hard to see what they are. They're like these really cool little bunnies that one of our designers made. They're like, yeah, you can't see them, so just yeah, take my word for it. Cool, anyway, so I won't, I won't uh, hold it up too much longer. But you can see, you get much better performance from multi-texture batching, which is currently where we are at with Pixie. Okay, cool. So let's move on to something different. Let's move on to filters. So, um, yeah, I'm going to talk about how they work and how we do stuff underneath and, um, and what they are. So I'm, I'm sure a lot of you guys have used these before. Uh, they're, they're basically a visual effect uh, that generally is something you do on each pixel of an image. Uh, obviously, you get me Photoshop, After Effects, uh, Flash had them, we have them as well. They're really handy because they, they let you do some really crazy visual things that you just can't do with, here's an image. Um, so, obviously, if you were to do this on the CPU, it would be nuts because uh, to run a function on, on a pixel, on every pixel on an image, it actually takes a long time, which is why we never made a filter system for the canvas renderer. Because if you had, a, say, like a 1024, 7, 6, 8 image, um, the number of pixels is uh, 786,432. So if you imagine every frame you were running through that and doing, a, doing some code on the pixel, like blurring or something, you could, you know, smoke would basically start coming out of the machine. So, uh, so that's a no-go. But WebGL is not like that at all. Um, so the shaders and the things that run on the GPU, they're basically designed for this kind of stuff. They're designed for per-pixel operations. So you move, if you move that code to the graphics card, um, the GPU is basically designed for that. It can run, it can run that mass on all the pixels. It, it can do, it can do things in parallel, and it, it basically running a function on a, on a per pixel basis is it's super fast. It's like fast and easily fast enough for us to do this. You know, make this filter system. So um, yeah, good old good old WebGL again. Um, I'm going to show you guys. Uh, uh, so yes, yeah, so the filters are written in uh, GLSL. I don't know if you guys have played around with that. It, it looks a lot like C. Um, each shader is made up of two parts. I wonder if. Okay, cool. So, so this is really high level. What is a shader? Uh, it's basically two things. It's a, a vertex shader and a fragment shader, and those together that's what makes a program. 
Um, the vertex shader is basically it takes the points that you give it, so you generally give it, say, like a triangle, and the vertex shader is the code that says where these points end up on the screen. That's all it cares about. It's like, here's my points, and the vertex shader goes, I'm going to put them here. And that's in Pixie, that's where we do the camera multiplicate, the matrix multiplications. And then the second part is the fragment shader. So once it's done that, it basically runs through the triangle, and every single pixel in that triangle, basically the fragment program runs on it. So for filters in Pixie, what we do is we don't really care too much about this one. We just have a basic for this, but this is where you can do special things because this is when you, you're doing stuff on each pixel. So what you can do is essentially you have your quad and then you can draw it. And as you draw it, you can basically go, right, when I put this pixel here, do something special with it, like, like blur it or turn it into an ASCII character or something bonkers. So that's all cool. Um, but we wanted uh, we wanted the shader the, the filter system in uh, Pixie to be sort of a bit like the way it was in Flash. So we wanted it to be so if you go any, basically any container in Pixie, you could just go its filters are this. So you know filters equals here's a here's a blur filter. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So this is how you apply a filter in, in Pixie. You just create one and then you set it and you can give it an array of filters. Now the thing that, the things that happen underneath to, to make that happen are. Yeah, I'll kind of go through, but the, yeah, the idea is obviously you don't know how big a thing is. Like you can add it to a container with a bunch of stuff in it that's moving and changing size and rotating. So we had to spend a lot of time figuring out how to apply these filters in a way that wasn't super slow, not because we, we don't really know what we're applying the filter to. And we only know at runtime, we, we can't sort of prepare anything. So I'll take you guys through how we do that with Pixie. So uh, we're rendering through the scene graph, just like before. and. Then we get an object that's got a filter on it, and then what that what happens then is we basically so in this example here we've got our little fish pond, and those two fishes are in a container, and we've applied a, a blur filter to them. So what we do is we, we hit that container with the fishes, and it goes, oh, there's a, there's a filter there. So what it does is it it measures that container, and it goes, right, how big is how big are those two fish? What's their dimensions? And once it's got the dimensions, it will create a, a render texture off screen, and then it will instead of drawing the fish to the scene like it normally would, it will draw the fish to this render texture, and you end up with this little render texture here. And then what it will do is um, draw that render texture back to the main scene using the filter that you've applied. If, if you have a multi-texture, a multi sorry, a multi-pass filter, like a blur, which needs to run a couple of times, or you have an array of filters, it will draw to this, and then it will take another texture and draw to that with a filter pass, and then draw back, and it will kind of ping-pong, doing a pass, and it a filter pass on each one, and then the final one, it basically draws it back back to the main screen. Hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> Obviously the cool thing is, is this all happens in real time and um, the, the way that we deal with the textures is they're, um, they're all pooled so that we, we, we basically don't actually make the texture the exact size. We find the nearest power of two textures so that way because it's quite expensive to create and destroy textures on the fly so we just have a, a big pool of textures that we basically pull out of what we need and we just find the nearest the nearest power of two size rather than a than a very accurate one. So I'm just going to show you guys filters. Um, so this is the very first little example we ever made of them. So this one has the displacement map filter running on it, which I can take it off. And it's kind of this really fun little watery thing. There's tons of other filters as well. These are, I think these are like the, the old ones. So there's actually, the guys have made probably about 10 more different ones. But, um, the cool thing is that they can all be stacked up on top of each other as well. Um, and this one's quite cool. Twist. Don't know why we, we've, we've only ever used it once, but it's still uh, always looks quite nice. And then you've got super important ones like, like this. Don't know why you want it, but you can make uh, dot filters. And then we've got a really weird one which turns everything into cross hatches. But anyway, it's cool, because uh, these filters basically let you do extra cool stuff with, uh, with your games. I'm going to show you a couple of little experiments that we made using, using filters. So the first one is this. Um, this is kind of a custom filter thing that we did. So basically, um, behind the scenes, like there's this kind of universe thing in the background, and that's got like a one of our devs made this, and it's kind of like a, we, we call it the super shader. It basically does like a radial RGB color 
equation and, and, and a kind of a soft sort of blur. And then we've got another filter here which is a kind of distorts, acts as a mask and then also distorts the edges of this thing. Um, yeah, so that's a, a, an example of a custom filter. And then I'm going to show you guys one more custom filter that we did. Um, come on, internet. Hang on one second, I want to find that link again. custom filters, so we used one of our, our designers basically, he rendered these presents in 3D, but instead of uh, giving me 3D models, he basically uh, gave me normal maps. So it meant that we could build a really cool lighting system that basically makes the presents react as if they're 3D, but they're just 2D. And then the other thing we did was build a, a little uh, shadow caster that just makes the, the light look extra cool. And also, if you look in the corners as well, there's a, there's a, big dis there's a, a frosty displacement map over it as well just to give it that extra Christmassy feeling, I guess. I'll probably look at that for Christmas, but there's a, some of the stuff's out now. Um, so yeah, so this is a, you know, another example of, of filters in action. Okay, cool, so um, the next thing I'd like to show you guys is uh, the Pixie rope, which is essentially a, 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 an extension of the mesh that we have in, in Pixie. And this is actually one of my favorite my favorite things to use because it, it doesn't require much to actually make a really cool effect as long as it's rope based. Um, so obviously when you draw a quad in, in, in a Pixie, it's just two triangles, which is cool, but what about if you have more than two triangles? What if you have a, a row of them? And instead of just you know having them draw normally, what if you you know bend them and distort them a little bit? That's what the, the rope class is all about. So I'm gonna show you um, a little bit of source code of how we make this little snake guy and then how it actually, what it actually does under the hood. So this is how to make a snake in Pixie. You basically uh, loop through making a row of points, you get texture, it's the snake, and then you create a new rope, you give it a texture and you give it the points. And then what you end up with is in the, you know, in, in, the, in memory you basically have these, these four points. Um, what Pixie does is it takes those four points and it, it extrudes them out based on the, and depending on, on their position, it will kind of pull them out for you based on the, the height of the texture. And then the next thing it does is it turns them into little, uh, little triangles so the WebGL can understand what they are. Um, and this all happens underneath, like say so you just give it the points and the texture. And then the next thing it does is it applies the texture to those points. And, and, then, and then you have this cool thing where you've got like a, a texture on screen and it's basically, you've got these points that you can move around and, um, and then you end up with some really, you can end up with some really cool visual effects that aren't as a, a bit more fun than just, you know, here's an image on the screen. So, there we go. So this is the little snake and he basically, yeah, he's basically the, the points on the mesh and they're just moving around each frame and then the, the, the quad is basically getting calculated every frame. But yeah, like I say, it's a, it's a little bit more fun than just here is an image on the screen. Um, there's another example of the rope here. A lot of my experiments are Christmas based because it's like the only time we have time to make experiments. So uh, that's why they're all Christmassy. So this is one we made a little while back and basically uses the same principle. So this, these little strings here are, are pixie ropes with some physics 
this little cracker thing here is a, is a pixie rope, so if I click on it, you can see it's basically stretching the texture. We added a little modifier to basically, um, as you put it, it kind of pinches it in, just to make it feel like it was uh, stretching, and then if you put it, you get a super fun explosion. Um, and this actually has a bunch of filters on it as well, so that, that dot filter that we, we, we looked at before, we actually found, this is the only time I've actually found a use for it. Um, we basically applied it to the shading here, and it kind of makes it feel like a, we're going for that kind of Lichtenstein feel. So it kind of makes a really cool uh, effect on the shadow. And yeah, and then we also use the displacement map, and we use the particle container. So this is kind of a, uses a bit of everything out of the Pixie toolbox. But um, like I say, the, the fact that the, I think the, the fact that the mesh is distorting is something that just makes it feel a little bit more special than you know. Here's an image on the screen. And then there's one more, which is this other one, which is, again, using pixie ropes again. So this is basically upside down gravity, little uh, tentacles, just kind of with a bit of physics. Um, again, just a bit more fun than images. Um, so a little, little fish scene. OK, cool. So we've done lots of visual stuff. It's time to talk about um, something less visual, but no less important. So texture management. Basically, it uh, doesn't, doesn't sound that fun, but I have to be honest, it isn't. Um, but it's important. So what happens when you make a game is you obviously you load in all your textures, you kick them up to the GPU, you load in your levels, you kick it up to the GPU. Um, and basically, the bigger your game gets, the more textures you're probably putting on the GPU. So JavaScript, as we all know, is one of those languages that has a garbage collector and it makes memory managing uh, really easy. You basically lose all references to it, and eventually garbage collector comes along and goes, I'll take that for you, I'll tidy up. So it's really easy. Um, you don't have to worry about deallocating it, allocating it, all that kind of stuff. Um, so that's super handy. But when you are uploading textures to the GPU, it does not do that. If you upload a texture to the GPU, it's there forever until you tell it to go away. Um, so you upload, you upload all of your textures for your loading screen, they stay there forever until you, uh, in Pixie, until you dispose them or you destroy the textures. And there's there's no way that, you know, well, there was no way that we could figure out how to how to manage that for people. So it was just something that the you know the users had to, or the creators had to deal with. Um, and obviously, you know, with Pixie, obviously that there's other things that go on the GPU. There's buffers and there's shaders and there's textures. They're like the main things that you kick up there. But with Pixie, like buffers are tiny because it's all quads. Uh, Shaders are just tiny because they're tiny. Textures are not tiny. Textures are the thing that will, if you upload too many textures to a GPU, things will start running slow, uh, or worse still, it will just crash and you'll be like, oh, why did it crash? And it's usually because textures, or you know, textures are too big on an old device, then it will just run at one frame a second and you won't really fully understand why. But it's basically it's because there's no memory left on the GPU. Um, so that's an important thing to address. Uh, the way that we used to do this, um, for our games is, uh, well, when we used to make smaller games, it didn't really matter because you upload everything and it's fine. You, you know, you don't really, you don't really need to worry about it. But then obviously bigger games, you've got loads of worlds, loads of levels, loads of cool menus and stuff. And, and basically you can really uh, fill up your device. And certainly for low end hardware and cheaper hardware, you know, they don't have as much memory as, as modern devices. So it's something that, yeah, we need to, we need to worry about. The way we used to do it was, We'll go and load our loading screen, and and then we'd, 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 we'd the game would load, and then we'd go to our title screen, and we'd manually go right all those loading textures, unload please, and then we'd go to the level select screen and unload the title screen assets from the GPU, and we'd load the, the new ones, and then we'd go to the game, and we'd unload the level select assets and load the game assets, and it was cool, but like yeah, you know, it's a lot of extra work. It's kind of error prone. Like, what if you forget to unload a texture? What if a texture is shared? There's all of these kind of like oh things that just make it tricky and you know what you really want to do is focus on making your game not work focus on you know other, other too many textures on the GPU so like all things with Pixie we wanted to see if there was a way that we could make it uh, sort of work around that problem and, and make it not a problem make it basically make it work like the JavaScript garbage collector like can we can we do that without changing the API without breaking people's stuff um, Oh, no, that was a slide for that bit. Yes. So basically, we can. And what we did in, in version 
few and later is we added a garbage collector, a texture garbage collector into Pixie. So, um, and it is, it, 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 initially we had it disabled by default because, you know, we weren't sure what the people were worried about us sort of managing their textures, but in the end we turned it on because most people don't think about it and most people don't want to think about it. And so, so we ended up turning it on by default and in current version of Pixie, it is on by default. And basically what it does is it tries to manage the textures for you. And the, the way it does that isn't, isn't really that complicated, but it, it works quite, quite nicely. So uh, whenever you load a texture in Pixie, if you, if you load up 50 textures and then you render a scene with one of those textures, it will only upload that one texture because it, it basically does lazy loading. It will upload it at the point that it needs to render it. So if you've, if you've loaded the other, the other 49, they just exist, but they're not the GP because you haven't, they're, not, they're not required yet. So in a sense, we, we kind of only use what we need to anyway, so we had a good starting point. So the next thing we do is every couple of seconds, I think we, uh, we basically have a little process that loops through and just when, whenever a texture is used, we, we tag it, we put a little timestamp on it and go, this texture was used. And, and every, every, um, yeah, every few seconds, this garbage collector just goes through and goes, looks at the textures and goes, oh, when was the last time someone used this texture? And there's a time limit, I think it, I think it's one minute now. Basically, if, if a texture hasn't been used, if it, go, if it looks and it goes, oh, this hasn't been used in the rendering for, for over a minute, what it does is it just unloads it from the GPU for you behind the scenes. And it does it, if, it, if it has to unload a bunch of textures, it sort of spreads it out over a few frames so you don't notice it's happening. And then um, what that means is when you're not rendered, like when you move from the loading screen to the title screen, after a minute, you haven't touched those loading screen textures. So it will just quietly pull them off for you. But then if you go back to the loading screen, it will just lazy load them again like it did before. So that way, um, what the, the output of that is basically textures just clean themselves up off the GPU over time, which is really handy. Um, I can show you guys an example of it. There's only one game that actually runs with the inspector that I can show you guys it with. Um, oh, I just need to change that to be a little closed. So this is a little OGL inspector. It lets us see what's happening on the GPU. It's a bit buggy. It doesn't actually work with the latest version of Pixie. Um, but for the purposes of what we're showing you guys here, this is this is cool. So basically, these are all the textures that are on the GPU. Oh, thank you. My left, come on back. Okay, let's try that again. So these are all the textures that are on the GPU at the moment. You can see there's all these little logos. There's all these um, stickers. So I wonder if I can. I can't get access to the button. So that's helpful. There we go. So this was the first game where we actually included it. So there's a bunch of assets here. You can see like uh, loads of assets, assets, assets get loaded. Um, this person. Walk around. This inspector makes things run really quick as well, so that's why it's a little bit Benny Hill style. And there. So basically, you can see we're basically loading a ton of textures to sort of get this, this game into existence. But if you look, without us having to do anything, um, you can see that hopefully some of these will start to cross themselves out over time, which basically shows the, the GPU doing its thing. Please, please do what you're meant to do. <laughs> oh, there you go. This is hard to see. So these are basically uh, start to cross out. In fact, yeah. So all the, all of the slightly faded ones are basically the ones that have, that have basically been unloaded from the GPU. So it, it, it leaves you with just a, a few. So so over time, the textures just naturally empty out. And then as you go back, if I go back to that screen, those textures will just get added again. God, it's really hard to see, but basically, see these ones? These ones with the little crosses? Basically, they're the ones that have just been all automatically uh, taken off. So yeah, that's a, oh, there you go. You can see like these little crossed ones here. So yeah, that's basically in, in the current version of Pixie, but yeah, like I said, it means that hopefully you guys don't have to worry too much about managing your textures. The only textures that you do have to worry about managing are the, uh, the render textures because they are created by you and we don't know 
what's on them because you guys make them. So we can't delete them because if we do, they'll just be gone forever. Okay, cool. So, good, do good for time. Excellent. Okay, cool. So let's move on to the future of Pixie.js. Okay, so um, we're almost there with uh, version 5 of Pixie. I'm hoping that we'll have it ready for you guys by Christmas time. Um, and I wanted to show you a few of the cool features that we've added to version 5 that hopefully will make making games a little bit easier, a little bit faster. Um, so the first thing that we did was uh, introduced the image bitmap, which is something that someone showed me a little while ago that actually turned out to be pretty cool. So um, basically there's this function called create image bitmap, which is native, a native function that's just been introduced to Chrome and Firefox. Uh, I don't think that, that many people know it exists, um, I certainly didn't, but it's really cool. Basically what it does is it, um, you, you go create image bitmap and you give it a HTML image and then on another thread, it basically returns, it returns a promise. And on another thread, it basically decodes that image for you and it, it turns it into raw pixel data. So it's really cool because it's basically doing a lot of the heavy lifting, but it's doing it somewhere else on another thread. So it's not locking up the main, the main thread. And then when it's done, it just returns you a image bitmap, uh, this thing here. And what you can do is when you upload your texture in WebGL, instead of uploading the my, the my image like you normally would, you upload the image bitmap. And that image bitmap is way faster. It goes up much, much quicker because if you don't do that, then it has to decode it and then upload it. Whereas this, this way, it just goes up onto the GPU. So in version five of PC, I think, I think it's in version four as well. Basically, what happens as part of the loading process when you use our loader, it will load it and then it will run this and convert it to an image bitmap. And then it will tell you it's loaded. And then when you upload it, it will upload there as an image bitmap. And obviously, only Chrome and Firefox have this, and I'm sure it will it will spread to the other the other um, browsers soon. And when it does, it means that Pixie will use it for all of them. But if it doesn't, it just does it the odd way, so it falls back quite gracefully. So that's all cool. And then the other thing I want to show you guys is version five of Pixie has um, much better batching. Um, just going to get a link up here. So. One thing with version 5, 4 of Pixie is, is with sprites, we were always really, really focused on making that run really nice and fast. And one thing that always didn't run quite so good is, is the graphics. So you'd make some graphic stuff and they were never batched. It was always like, here's a graphic shape, draw it, here's another one, draw it, here's another one, draw it. And it's taken us a little while to figure out the best way to do it, but I think we cracked it now. So basically, this is version 4 of Pixie, just drawing a bunch of shapes. And you can see, like, we get to like over 1,000. You can see the frame rates drop in here. But with version five, not only are sprites batched, but also graphics are batched, and so are the meshes, as long as they aren't super complicated. So as long as the graphics object is less than 100 points, it, uh, it's more cost effective to just do the maths on the CPU and then batch it. So what that means is, this is version five of Pixie running that same example with the graphics. And this could basically be, uh, if this was a mix of sprites, graphics, all that stuff, it would, it would run a lot slower in version four. But version five, just keep going because it has much more efficient batching. That's been like my my homework for the last few months, and it, it's not been a fun journey. But I'm really glad that we're finally there. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah. So the cool thing is, is when we release version five, hopefully we'll have less draw calls because batches will be bigger. Um, graphics and, um, and all that stuff will be cool work. I, I haven't got any examples of this, but um, also with graphics, there's loads more functionality. They're like much more important now in version five. So you can texture them, you can cut holes out of them, you can um, you can combine them together, you can you can even create like a really complicated one and then use it as a template for other graphics objects. So that there's loads of ways to be much more memory efficient with your code. And then the most important part of, of version five of Pixie is something that has taken me most of the year to try and get right, and I <laughs> hope we're nearly there. Um, but you know, the world will tell me whether I'm whether I'm right or wrong here. So one thing that always bugged me about high-level engines—they're um, obviously amazing because you know you use a high-level engine and you can make your stuff. And you know, you guys don't want to focus on all the nitty-gritty of that. You want to focus on making your awesome game, right? And and so I noticed that with with Pixie, with with every single other 
rendering 3D tool out there. They, they have really good high level tools. It's like, do it our way and it's all good. Um, but what happens when you want to do something like lower level, something a bit more custom? And something that I always got, especially from people who are a bit more WebGL savvy, they'd always be like, oh man, it's really annoying. I want to do something underneath Pixie, but I have to kind of hack it to get, to get it to do it. And it's always the way with, with high level engines. You just have to, they're not really designed to expose that other layer. Uh, you know, of the, you know, writing Pixie and then switching to pure WebGL is, is tricky because you have to manage the state and, and be very sort of efficient on how things are. So what we wanted to do is basically make new level in Pixie, which is the mid-level API. And it's, it's 2D, 3D agnostic. It's, it's super optimized, so where we can, we optimize all of the WebGL for you. And it's WebGL 1 and WebGL 2. And um, it's, yeah, it's 2D, 3D agnostic. Um, and, and we like to think of it as like simplified, easy WebGL. So we take the concepts of WebGL and we, we build on it until eventually, and we build the API basically trying to do it so that you can do anything you can in raw WebGL, but in just a lot less code. But you still have all of the high-level stuff, so you can still do all of your sprites and all of your textures and all the high-level stuff, but then you can switch gears into this, this other API, do some crazy stuff, and then switch back to adding buttons to the screen. And, and that's something that I think is going to be really cool, because it means that people can basically just do some really gnarly, crazy stuff. So yeah, um, the other cool thing is, is this API you know, pure WebGL is, is, is difficult to learn, so, but the concepts are the same. So if you, if you use this API, once we've got it out there and it's all documented, if, if, if you're new to WebGL, you can use this API and kind of get a good grasp of the concepts, understand how to, how to do this stuff. And then if you need to, um, you know, by the time you actually go to say you want to learn pure WebGL, you'll, you'll go in a lot easier because you'll be like, oh, I know the concepts and I know what I'm trying to do. And obviously, yeah, for, for experts, this API is just a playground where you can do really fun things. Uh, it basically boils down to three components. Um, so the first thing is there's a geometry. And this is really similar actually to how uh, 3D as well. Like the, it's just everything here is, is 2D. Um, well, the pixie bit, the, the, the high level pixie bits are. So um, a geometry basically just represents attribute data. So an object being rendered, you can just go, here's my points, here's my UVs, here's my whatever it is you want to add um, into that list. And basically you create uh, it creates this geometry object, which you can then pass around and, and use. And under the hood, it works using uh, vertex array objects, which are a really nice, fast way of, of managing shape, uh, sort of attribute state. Um, it has a caching layer, so that if you make you know, 10 of these, it only actually creates one on the GPU. And it's uh, so just like textures, we just try to cache so you don't leak stuff onto the GPU. Um, the other thing is when you're writing the code for this, uh, we infer as much as we can from the shader. So you don't have to say, for example, go, oh, the size of my attribute is this, or the position of it is here. We can just look at your geometry, look at the shader, and kind of understand what you're trying to do. So where, where we can, we'll fill in the gaps, meaning that the API is, is even simpler. You can override and add, add these functions if you want, but otherwise we'll just kind of basically sand over all of the horrible details of WebGL. Um, it also has, um, yeah, it has the ability to clone, merge, and also interleave the data automatically for you, which is handy. Um, the other part is the shader. So we, we always had shaders in Pixie, but these shaders are now much, 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 much more flexible. So you create a shader, and then under the, under the scene, it creates a program which is cached, so it never creates multiple programs. Um, it has a really cool way for setting uniform, so updating properties on a shader can be a bit of a pain. So we've sort of sanded over all of that and um, you, just, you just give it a JavaScript object and then we, we take care of the rest. And it, it's crazy optimized as well. So there's, there's loads of caching so that if an object hasn't changed, it won't upload it. But also the, the way that the upload code is generated is we actually dynamically create the function because I, I wanted it to be as fast as if you handwritten the code yourself. So that's, that's what we do. We basically, depending on the object you give it and the shader, it will write code for you the fastest way of uploading it, which is really cool. And then the other, the other main part is state, which is how, uh, you know, what is the state of WebGL that I'm rendering in? So a simple one would be blend mode. Like, what's my blend mode? Um, but there might also be, am I cutting? Or is, is my, is, should I use, you know, should I use uh, depth testing? And the way that we build this, this is one of the things that, again, it took ages to get right, but I'm really happy with it. So there's tons of WebGL state, but 
comparing when you draw one thing and then you change the state. You know, you don't want to have to compare everything and go, what changed? Okay, so change this, change this, change this. You want it. What we wanted is to just go, you know, are they different? And the way we managed to do that is by bit packing the WebGL state into one number. So every switch in WebGL has a little binary place in this number. And we, depending on the switches, we just make up a number. So it means that when you compare states, you just go, is that number the same as that number? And it works really well because it means that it, that's as fast as you can get for checking. And then um, if it is different, then I've forgotten how we managed to do this, but we looked through it in a way that it only actually addresses the differences. So if, if, if two states are different, the, 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 the things that happen on WebGL, only, only the changes get enacted. So it means it's super, super fast. So I'll show you guys. Yeah, that's basically um, the structure of version 5 of Pixie. So this level API is designed for everyone to use. It's not just for basically the 2D stuff is built on top using this API. So the sprite batcher is a geometry. It is a shader. It has a state. The graphics is a geometry, has a shader, has a state. Everything that you use in Pixie version 5 is those three things. And, but, but as well as having access to all that stuff, you, you know, end users now have access to this thing here, which is, which is the bit where all the magic is going to happen, I think, I hope. And um, hopefully it'll be, it'll be easier for people to do plugins and do sort of really crazy, crazy kind of rendering as well. So I'm going to show you guys. Just really quickly, the, the WebGL code for it. Oh, no, not that one. That one. So, this, this is basically, I'm trying to think of the best way to do this. So, okay, I'll show you pure WebGL, right? This is pure WebGL, and this is, yeah, sure. Is that okay? Can you guys see that? Cool, so this is pure WebGL, like a, this is more, uh, you know, you don't have to understand this uh, because WebGL is difficult. But basically, this is all the code that you need to write uh, to draw a triangle using pure WebGL. Um, you basically have to find some buffers, create some states. Like, there's basically tons of stuff, and it's really complicated. And if you get one thing wrong, then none of it works. But in the new API we have for Pixie, the same thing. So the only thing that remains the same here is we take the same shader code, so we take this bit and we take this bit. Basically the same code, all we have is, is this basically, so we go, oh, I want to make a new geometry, I want to have an attribute, vertex position, here's my numbers, I want to have an attribute color, here's my numbers, so you don't have to specify any of the details, Pixie will just figure it out for you. Um, so basically it will just naturally auto automatically tie these things together for you, and then you create a new shader and you just give it your fragment, no, vertex code and then your um, fragment code, and that's your shader done. It will compile it, it will, it will optimize it, it will set everything for you behind the scenes. And then you just create a new pixie mesh, and you give it the geometry and the shader. And then you just add it to the scene, and that's, that's it, basically. So all of that WebGL just kind of boiled down to, you know, it's still just powerful, still is flexible. You can do anything you want with this stuff. I mean, I can show you, I'll show you how amazing it is. Um, <laughs> so it doesn't it doesn't look like much, right? But but this is this is the basis for everything. This is the basis for doing anything you want in WebGL. So you still have to learn the basics, but but it's not gonna basically you can do this while you're still using the high level stuff in Pixie. So you can still add a sprite to this theme and you can still add a you know add a text field. So you can still do everything that you do, but you can also just just do this, and it, and it will just work. And I'll show you guys um, some of the examples of what we've been using at Good Boy, uh, using this stuff. So we, we basically, my main thing was like, I wanted to see if, you know, if I could build 3D on top of this API. So what do we have? Um, so I'll quickly whiz through a few examples. Again, uh, all Christmas based. Merry Christmas again. So this is the little car example we made. So this is using Pixie version 5, and we just basically made a 3D thing on it. I mean, it, it took a bit of effort because we had to write like a, a parser for models and a few bits of bobs. But the cool thing is, is it renders the 3D stuff, and then we still have access to all of the low-level stuff, all of the regular Pixie bits as well. And so that's, that's one <coughs> example. And then we have 
another little example. So this was us playing around with the mat matrices. Um, then this is like a this classic kind of into the screen lane lane uh, three lane games. But we we take the the game is literally it is actually on the you know conceptually it all happens in a straight line. But visually what we do is we just twist it around a, a spine and like make it feel like it's a roller coaster. Um, so I get a bit back up. Oh, okay, turbo boost. Cool, so yeah, again, it just shows like hopefully the, the flexibility, like if you want to build something like this, you can. Um, and then I've got one more example, which is something we actually literally just launched um, this week, actually. So this is all written in Pixie. This is actually used in Pixie Flash. So like the, the designers animated all this in Flash, and then we uh, we built a little uh, on top of on top of it. We basically combined uh, 3D and 2D. So so this is basically see that that little button effect there. That's kind of like a custom a custom mesh using that kind of uh, principles I showed you guys before on a 2D layer of Pixie, and then it's mapped to a bit of a 3D a 3D thing that we made uh, underneath. Um, but yeah, the, the cool thing is, it's, it's basically the fact that we can do all of all of the stuff we normally do, but just switch gears to this little three D renderer that the team's been working on, and and, and back again without um, without without much effort, which is really cool. Okay, so that's some of the cool stuff you can do. Oh, there we go. Got to the end. Okay, I'm finished. Okay, so uh, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>